Uh, I'll be talking to you about a challenging case of bicuspid aortic stenosis TAVR. And these are the other members of our valve team who are pivotal in this case. So this is a 65-year-old man with a history of known bicuspid aortic valve disease who also had hypertension and atrial fibrillation. So he'd had mild to moderate aortic stenosis. had been watched clinically for many years, no symptoms. But in the last several months, he did slowly developed heart failure symptoms, some dyspnea exertion. And he had a repeat echocardiogram that demonstrated a new decline in his LV systolic function. So you can see on this parasternal long axis view, depressed ejection fraction, <coughs> apical three chamber view shows, five chamber view shows a heavily calcified aortic valve that's stenotic. And the continuous wave Doppler through the valve demonstrates gradients that are in the severe range. So we underwent a perioperative uh, coronary angiography, which demonstrated a 50% stenosis in the mid-right coronary large dominant vessel. And then the left coronary system has some LAD disease there, noted the bifurcation with that diagonal. So overall, the patient had a low STS score, not a lot of comorbidities. So after discussion at our multidisciplinary valve conference, we thought the best course of treatment for him would be surgical AVR, given the bicuspid disease with possible bypass. So while he was an outpatient awaiting the planned elective AVR, he presented to the emergency department with worsening heart failure symptoms and was admitted for treatment. And after several days of diuresis, he was feeling better, and the plan was to just do the AVR during that admission. But then there was a turn of events. So the night before his surgery, he developed sudden onset chest pain just after dinner and has this EKG. So the cath lab was activated emergently and he went there and had an acute thrombotic occlusion of the right coronary artery with a, you can appreciate a very high thrombus burden throughout this vessel. So we wired this and there was so much thrombus, we actually performed aspiration thrombectomy in addition to ballooning and stent placement. So at this point, with that turn of events, so let me advance this. So he had a peak troponin of over 200. And at this point, we paused to reassess the plan for treating aortic stenosis. So given his worsening LV function, as demonstrated here on this echo, the, in addition to RV dysfunction now, we felt that TAVR might be a better approach for treating his aortic stenosis, except for a new LV thrombus that was noted, another term of events here. So we went ahead and performed a TAVR CTA, and this demonstrated a Seavers type 0 confirmation by cuspid aortic valve and a pretty large valve area. You can see an area on the valve of 300 and or 932 square millimeters and a perimeter of 108. And so we continued him on triple therapy with anticoagulation in addition to dual antiplatelet therapy, repeated imaging, but the thrombus was still there. The patient was not doing very well clinically, so we decided to just move forward with the TAVR. So we chose the core valve, 34 Evolute, uh, and proceeded with the TAVR. So you'll note the... There was a four week. four week, yeah. And then we repeated the echo and, How, yeah. how much oversight, like, I'll, I'll ask you this, because does this one over eight feels like four or five percent oversized only for surgical? Uh, it, it is oversized, but I don't know exactly about how much. It's like three. Yeah, so you'll note the, uh, so we perform um, valvuloplasty with a balloon, and you'll note the wire position. We intentionally avoided putting it in the apex to avoid disrupt, disrupting that thrombus. I didn't see a sentinel. So we, we actually didn't have sentinel at that time? Okay. Yeah. Good question, though. So here we are deploying the valve. Uh, we did this very slowly, very carefully, without pacing, because we uh, were just doing it very carefully here. You can see the first injection. We're deploying the valve. And we're happy with the position here. We, we unsheath the valve a little bit more, another angiogram, uh, aortogram, and no, no leak there. And then there's another turn of events because the valve embolized into the aorta. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, so we learned from our mistakes and <laughs> implanted a second valve a little bit deeper, this time with rapid pacing too. And we used a snare, which you can see in the next shot, not on this one, to anchor the first valve in place. And here's the snare there, and then this is the unsheathed second evolute valve in position now in the aortogram showing mild paravalvular leak there. So the patient did well. There was no evidence of stroke. We did this under conscious sedation too. He was discharged on post-op day two, did well. And you can see on this echo, you can see the two valves. It, it doesn't really show them in series on here, but this is the higher valve and it had no obstruction of the arch vessels uh, and they're both functioning well. Uh, and then he was actually just seen in follow-up doing well with uh, minimal symptoms. So just some conclusions. So as you brought up, Taver valve sizing um, could be challenging in the case of a, the bicuspid aortic valves because of the morphology uh, and the presence of an LV thrombus is not necessarily a contraindication to Taver, especially if there's no other options, but it requires careful guide wire positioning. And third thing is that a snare can be used to anchor an embolized valve in place so it won't move when you're putting in the second valve. And that's it. I don't know what's your experience with a Sentinel device. I mean, I'm trying to get it for a long time. And obviously, everyone knows that Boston Scientific had, uh, had bought the company right now. I don't know if things are going to change. But it's been extremely difficult with uh, no CMS guidance. And, uh, and it's still a small size company. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure how. Uh, uh, active they are in uh, opening sites, so, but uh, they're definitely expanding. Uh, but they do have a limited workforce, and so far there's no coverage. So as long as you know, there will be definitely a financial impact on the, on the procedure. But these are really challenging cases. I mean, if I wrote this down correctly, you had a, 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 an area of 930, I think, and your perimeter of 109. Yeah. So your, your 34 is actually not oversized at all. It's, it's, it's undersized, right? So it's really challenging because you, you have no valve. I mean, you can do 10 cc's extra on your 29. The, the engineers say they, it, it should work because of the calcification. I mean, it's really challenging. So, um, I mean, we have to congratulate it. It works, but, but you embolize, you know, because... And the high implant. So yeah. in retrospect, would you... Would you I know that Abbott, the, the uh, Medtronic is going to do a uh, bicuspid trial, but in retrospect, now that you go into practice at some point, would you say, hey, surgeon, you, you've got to have to uh, take this patient on, or would you try this again? I think n knowing what we learned from this one, I think we could avoid some of those missteps, and I think it can be done yeah. safely. See, the other problem is not all bicuspids are created equal. I mean, this is clearly a Siebert Zero by Cuspid, and you know, there's absolutely no raffing. I mean, if usually when you have raffing, you can count on that raffing, the calcification of the raffing, and you can have a prediction about how, you know, how, how much this valve will open. In this case, it was, it was a Siebert Zero valve, and I think, uh, and you're right, I mean, the Medtronic trial is going to be extremely interesting, but how, uh, you know, how are we going to classify by Cuspid because they're not created equal? 